Now, I could do the same spiel that I've done on data literacy now maybe four, five, ten times. Um, I've got a lot to say on it. What I will say is I get to say whatever I like. And <laughs> I've done this presentation plenty of times before. And on LinkedIn this morning or this afternoon when I was promoting this talk, what did I say? I said, um, I've done this field plenty of times before, and you're all welcome to uh, visit uh, prior versions or uh, prior takes of this very important topic of data literacy. Um, and in this case, I'm going to spend a bit less time motivating why data literacy matters and spending a bit more time answering a question that everybody asks, which is, what the heck is data literacy anyway, before you tell us why it matters? Actually, this is the wrong way around, but you're going to get the wrong way around. I'm also going to get into something very controversial relative to this audience, which is that in my travels, there are a lot of people who have as their job description data engineer and data architect and data steward and data governance person and sometimes chief data officer who might consider to be data illiterate. How uh, confronting does that sound? So uh, oh, is that a question for me? No. So no, you are, you are yet to receive questions from your audience. Well, I scared everyone. I usually do that. Um, You're a very scary person. No, no. Um, so uh, let's get on with it. Look, um, what the heck? I'm going to I'm going to give you the usual spiel, but I'll do it very quickly. How much time do I have, Mr. Wallace? Uh, I'm thinking we should probably call it a day after four hours. Four? I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need these people for at least a week, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking half an hour or so would be. Uh, Half an hour. And what I, what I, what I usually do is write the oral questions and possibly answer them later. So how much time does that give you? Yeah, 30, yeah, 30 minutes. Let's see how we go. Jesus. Okay, fine. All right. Look, um, so whatever this thing called data literacy is, oh, let, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Look, data literacy, as far as I'm concerned, I'll tell you what it isn't. It's not your ability to code. It's not your knowledge of stack. So if you tell me that you can use this tool and this tool and that tool, that's meaningless. Well, it may be useful, but if all you say is, hey, I've, I've used Kubernetes and I've used Tableau and I've applied it on AWS and on, uh, on Google Cloud and I've also done lots of things with Python and I've even used TensorFlow, I'd go, okay. Okay, that doesn't automatically make you data literate. Sorry. Um, so it's not the stack you use. Um, what the heck is it? Well, here's what to me is strictly speaking data literacy, which is it's actually your ability to meaningfully engage with data to either directly make decisions based on that data or at least to make useful recommendations or have useful input into decisions made with data. Now, how is that not, look at all the cool shit I can do with the stack. How is that? How is it not, look at all my IT skills? Well, I, I'll, I'll answer it with an analogy. Imagine it's the 1400s and we're in the printing press revolution. Now, there are certain people who are writers. They write books for a living, yeah? They, they pull things out of their heads and they create content. There are also people who read books. In fact, they're most of the customers. They actually read books, you know, they read letters. And then there are people who print books and they do things like possibly make paper, possibly mix ink, possibly run printing presses. Let's talk about printing presses. And they know all about printing press technology. Now you can have people who know everything about everything you can do with a printing press and yet can't read and write. Now, to me, those people are certainly involved in the process of books, of reading and writing, but I think you'll agree they're missing something absolutely vital. They're missing perhaps 
They're, they're certainly enabling reading and writing. They're certainly enabling, you know, the literature process, but they're not actually participating in it at all. And what I find is that a lot of people with an IT bent have the same relationship with data. Sure, they know how to get data from point A to point B. Sure, they know how to move tremendous quantities of data at certain in certain uh, you know fractions of time. So this, this is the, the the you know the three V's of big data. To me, the three big V's of big data. If you're focused on them, you're not focused on data literacy because data is not a commodity. Data is not a liquid that you pump through a machine and brag about how much of it you've pumped through at what speed. Every bit of data is different. Every little bit of data is special. Data literacy is about actually engaging with data to extract meaning from it. And by the way, data exists for only one purpose, to make better decisions. And that, by the way, doesn't mean making decisions easier. Actually engaging with data is hard and it requires a tremendous amount of skill. So data literacy means being able to engage meaningfully with data. So step one is actually looking at data. So this has interesting consequences, right? Because I keep meeting people who are BI professionals, for example, who, uh, you know, they work in BI for years. And when I talk to them, they, they want to talk about stack. They want to talk about all the tools they're using. They want to talk about the processes they use, et cetera. And I'll say, do you actually look at the reports you generate? No. Or, oh, I check them for errors and then off they go. As in, so you don't actually analyze the data. You don't, as a human being, do something with the data that a computer can't. No, I just generate the data. Well, le let's leave aside the threat to one's career of being a non-automated step in something that's a process. I, uh, I I don't know if I need to convince you of the uh, of, of the of the career um, career risks involved in being what is effectively a process worker, even when that process is currently semi-repeatable. Um, but from a data literacy perspective, I would say that's not that's not a role that requires a lot of data literacy. It requires a lot of computer literacy, requires a lot of IT skill. But you know, this is the head of uh, the eye opener number two. I do not consider analytics, data analytics, which is using data to help us make better decisions. I don't consider it to be remotely an IT discipline. As in, in the org chart, it should be as far from IT as possible. It should be managed a completely different way. It should have completely different expectations. And I can go into that in great detail, and I'm sure questions will come up on it, but uh, that's not my main point. What I want to tell you is that with the way things are going with COVID, with the way things are going with our economy, I think we're going to see some very, very interesting changes to uh, the efficiencies of our organizations. And also, I think we're going to see some very interesting changes to the importance of good decision making. Because in good times, it's not that important to make good decisions. In good times, you can get away with a lot. In good times, important people can spend all their time or much of their time doing PR and doing internal politics. And indeed, for a lot of people, I find that for them, if I tell them that there's more to being at a strategic level of an organization than PR and politics, they give me this dismissive look of, I'm a total idiot. Because for many people, their, almost their entire career is showmanship. I think this will change. I actually think this will change. And I think that making decisions is going to be the difference between the company surviving and therefore everyone's still having a job and a company falling over. And I think much more attention is going to be paid to people's impact on the health of the companies they're in or <laughs> recently left because they got fired or the company folded. So we're entering a world where jobs are going to be scarce. Jobs are going to have to deliver value and making decisions is going to be really, really important. So we're entering a world where I think everybody, any any white collar professional is going to need to be way more data literate than before. Um, I have a much longer, you can, you can view my previous uh, talks for a more detailed discussion of why this is the case. But the long and the short of it is there's a whole set of skills. And these skills are basically the, the ability to look at data. I have a, I have a sort of a semi- uh, semi-ironic comment I make, which is to say, well, if you want to learn data science, you need to understand two things. You need to understand data and you need to understand science. Let's unpack that. So to be data literate, and I don't just mean a data scientist, okay? Data scientists are, are the experts. And just like with, with computer literacy, we still have IT experts. So too with data literacy, we'll, we'll still have data anal analytics professionals, we'll still have data scientists, we'll have other names for so much people, machine learning engineers and so forth. 
actually good debate about whether machine learning engineering is data science, and I think people are realizing it's not. Um, but uh, I think uh, I think it pays to it pays to note that there is this massive, massive body of knowledge that we all have, but we don't put in our resumes because it's taken for granted. It's called computer literacy. Just like none of us needs to put in their resume can read and write, it's just taken for granted and has been for year, for decades, maybe 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 a century or two, that if you're a professional, you can read and write. But for the last 20 years, it's been taken for granted that you're also computer literate. Do you know what a massive, massive skill set computer literacy is? You don't put it in your resume because it's just assumed. You pick it up as a kid. You, many of you probably don't remember a time in your lives when you weren't computer literate, yeah? I certainly remember it. it shows how old I am. Um, computer literacy is an essential, quite massive and non-trivial skill set, which we don't even notice. But what I'm seeing is that there is a similarly big skill set that a lot of professionals, most professionals, don't have. And indeed, they don't have it to the point that they don't even realize they don't have it. So 20 years ago, if someone wasn't computer literate, they were painfully aware of it. If they weren't painfully aware of it, their management certainly was, and I don't know that they lasted very long. Um, whereas now, the most computer the most data illiterate people tend to be uh, the most oblivious to the fact, and uh, the people they report to tend to be even more or equally uh, data illiterate and even more or equally oblivious. So the people worried about the people least worried about their data illiteracy tend to be, tend to be the people that worry me the most. And why do they worry me? Because I think the biggest impediment to realizing value from data analytics, the biggest impediment to actually turning data analytics into good decisions, which I will argue with any of you is the only real reason for data analytics. So if you can come up with a good reason for data analytics that's not improved decision making, I'd like to hear about it. Um, but, uh, and by the way, that means improved decision making at a whole range of levels. So. So the idea of decision making is pretty broad, but it is decision making. So the reason I go on about data literacy is that what I see is that organizations spend an enormous amount of money on stack, on hardware, on software, on uh, consultants to put a whole lot of architecture and stack in place. And of course, headcount, lots of data scientists, lots of data engineers, lots of data this, lots of data that. But how much value is the organization realizing from them? Indeed, how often does the organization not even have a clear idea of what that value looks like, how to measure that value, how to manage that value in those people, how to tell if they're doing a good job or a bad job? Well, um, in my experience, they don't always. And I'm being very kind by not telling you exactly how often I see it done badly. And the shortcoming is always that data literacy thing. We're talking about a market that's willing to spend on something very sexy, but has a lack of very, very minimal entry level skills to even be the beneficiary of it. So if I had to rate data literacy relative to computer literacy, I remember when the internet browser first appeared and within like two or three years, everybody went from zero to hero with computer literacy because suddenly everybody knew how to use a computer and knew how to browse the net and knew how to, use, how, to, how to send emails. It was quite incredible watching the transformation. This happened starting around 1994 in my memory. It's probably actually 93, but it was 94, 95 that I first came across a web browser. Um, where are we now with data literacy? I think we're more like in 1990. I don't think we've even hit the start of the revolution. Now, I think uh, COVID has certainly given it a good kick. Um, now, I actually think that the transformation, well, actually 1990, no, I'll revise that. I'll say 1992. I think we're very close. I think we're very close to uh, various, shall we say, Darwinian forces um, selecting for those organizations that are making good decisions because there are now going to be consequences to bad decisions the way they weren't before. Um, just in just these being harsh economic times. So that gets me to what the heck do I mean by data literacy and back to that point about, well, if you want to be good at data science, you need to be good at data and you need to be good at science. What does being good at data means? 
And in my book, being good at data doesn't mean being able to ETL a whole, a whole mess of data. It doesn't mean even building a gigantic, uh, a, a gigantic uh, neural network with you know dozens of layers and millions of nodes across um, across uh, Kubernetes clusters. That's not what makes you good at data in my book. To be data literate, which is to say to be able to make good decisions from data, not enable someone else making good decisions from data at a technical level, but actually enable it at a knowledge level, you need to be able to look at data. You need to be able to talk to data. And we have a set of skills for talking to data, which we broadly call statistics. So the first part of data literacy is basically speaking the language that the data is trying to talk to you in, which is the language of statistics. Now, I don't mean everybody going away and doing a master's of stats, which incidentally is what I tend to recommend when people say, how do I become a data scientist? I usually say, oh, um, I don't know about any of those masters of data science courses, which everyone is doing. But if you want my advice and if you want to be the sort of person that I'd notice and consider employing, do a master's of stats. That's usually that's usually what I suggest. Um, again, for reasons I won't, I kind of going into now, which is that statistics is a language of data. Statistics is just really about two things. It's about uncertainty and it's about structure. It's about, well, um, how likely things are and giving you a precise language to talk about likelihood in, in the context of the other thing, which is structure, complexity. So if you can understand, visualize, describe, communicate, and take advantage of uncertainty and complexity, you're doing really well because that's the language data speaks. And that's why you need to understand, you need an intuition for the language of stats. And you need th that intuition the way you have an intuition for uh, um, for using a browser, which is very different than passing an exam, right? Um, it actually means having the concepts more than knowing formula. So that's the data part. What about the science part? Well, science, okay, we can talk about the scientific method. We can talk about running experiments. We can even talk about really fancy stuff like non-experimental causal inference, which is about the most fancy and useful data science that you can do, and most people don't even know that it exists. But I'm talking about something a bit more philosophical and fundamental. And this is where data science, by the way, and analytics in general, as I said, is so far removed from IT and stack and engineering, it's not funny. This is the point where if you're an engineer, your job is to build stuff. You know, everyone says, oh, I'm here to solve problems. I'm not here to solve problems. I'm here to figure out what problems need solving. That's what a data scientist does. And that's generally what you do as a decision maker. Most of the time, most of the time you're deciding what to decide about next. You know, having something clear to solve, that's easy. Knowing what to pay attention to, that's the hard part. That's what science is. Science is about facing the unknown every day and seeing what comes at you. You can't manage that the way you manage an IT project. You can't manage that the way you manage software. So be aware of that. I'm watching the questions come thick and fast, which is a sarcastic way of saying you, you folks have got no questions at all. Um, how am I doing for time, Mr. Wallace? Uh, you're doing fan fantastically well. Like I think we're into our last two hours. Okay. So um, I'm just wondering now, what I've left out. I've sort of breezed through and I've, I've gone backwards. And I guess I'll focus now on the what I am seeing, which is that a lot of the data engineers and data architects and heck, a lot of people who call themselves data scientists aren't actually data literate. They treat they treat data as as a substance, as a liquid, as 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 oil or water or whatever the heck else that you pump through a machine and focus on building those machines, but they never look at the data. They can't tell me what's in the data and they see their job as building stuff. Analytics is not about building stuff in the same way that biology is not about cleaning test tubes. Cleaning test tubes is, an, is, is you know, a lot, a lot less good biology would be done if someone didn't clean test tubes, sure. But cleaning test tubes is not, does not make you a biologist. And the cleaning test tubes part of the job isn't the biology part. Equally, I write code. I have to. I was doing some coding today. I am in no sense an engineer. Oh, spoiler alert. I'm, I'm a crap coder, though. I'm kind of becoming better. But that's not my main job. The code is a means to an end. The end is I'm exploring something new every day. When you're doing IT, 
where's the uncertain what's uncertainty uncertainty is a problem uncertainty is a nightmare uncertainty is bugs uncertainty is uh, budget overflow uncertainty is when things happen that shouldn't be happening if you're a data scientist and if you even if you if you're engaging in any kind of meaningful analytics uncertainty is the reason you have a job and uncertainty is where opportunities come from as well as risks so uh, i'm not saying one is better and one is worse i'm not saying you need one and not the other i'm not saying that at all um, and in fact, most of the time, if you have to pick one, it's like, should I have a data scientist or should I have an engineer? You usually want an engineer. Getting stuff done is usually more important than wondering out loud what the next thing is. But bear in mind that they're different jobs and bear in mind that the, well, the specialized data science job, well, that's a job too. But also bear in mind that an important part of data literacy is meaningfully being able to do that on your own. So people talk about citizen data science, which I mostly scoff at except to say that there are aspects of being a data scientist that I think everybody, and especially people with, uh, I guess, an IT bent, need to pick up. And in particular, it's this, it's this exploration thing, which the more sort of entrepreneurial technical people do when they do it with technology. So I'm not going to discount that. However, in the corporate setting, um, I see a lot less of the exploratory part being done um, deliberately. Um, and where data is concerned, data is a country. It's like an undiscovered country that you explore. So the data literacy of, in my experience, of data engineers tends to be a very interesting thing because I teach courses. By the way, I teach courses in this stuff, probably worth telling you. So Alpha Zeta and the Alpha Zeta Academy has courses in data literacy and data-driven decision-making. Um, can you please explain the difference between AI engineer, ML engineer, data analyst, data scientist in a short summary? Um, yeah, uh, the point that first, first of all, there are no formal differences. Well, there are fuzzy differences, yeah? So each one of those terms is something that is being actively shaped by people in trying to define themselves, often very, very perversely. Each one of those is being pushed forward by, um, by recruiters. I mean, here's a good one. What's the difference between a data scientist and a statistician? About $60,000. Uh, you know, people will automatically rebrand themselves. Most of the people I meet who call themselves data scientists, I do not think deserve that title. However, I do not own the definition of data scientist. I have my own definition, sure, but no one owns it. Um, generally speaking, I'd say AI engineer and machine, machine learning engineer are synonyms. Strictly speaking, Machine learning is a subset of AI. In colloquial terms these days, people say AI is deep learning and machine learning is any machine learning that isn't, that isn't uh, neural nets, which is actually a kind of machine learning. So it's an absolutely perverse mislabeling, but, but for all intents and purposes, let's say AI engineer, it's probably a machine learning engineer who does more neural nets and the machine learning engineer is a machine learning engineer who does more non-neural net stuff, if I had to guess. Really, they're one and the same. And yes, neural nets is just another supervised machine learning method. It's really not that different from the tree-based stuff for the most part, especially what most people need to do in large organizations. Yes, there's a bunch of cool specialized stuff that makes neural nets different, and most people do not do that for a living at all. Data analyst is an incredibly general term, which means all kinds of things. Usually what it means is not a data scientist. Usually it means someone interested in analyzing data, but they don't have the statistical background. I find sometimes it means not even a data analyst. Sometimes it actually means data engineer. By the way, data engineer is what I usually mean as a support staff for a data science function, but there are many other kinds of data engineers. The two main kinds are um, the kind that helps you ingest data into the data science sort of Warren lab and the kind that helps you deploy models. And by the way, the kind that helps you deploy models is probably the kind that's, uh, that, that's emerging into what was it, model ops or something like that. Look, all these terms are fluid, really. But ultimately, there are two kinds of people. There are people who build things, and there are people who explore things. Um, or rather, there are two kinds of activities, and people tend to focus on one or the other. Ideally, you want to be good at both, but I find that personality traits mean that you're usually better at one than the other. Uh, my, my own disagreeableness and ADHD probably mean that I make a better data scientist than I do a, uh, a uh, software engineer. I always made a terrible software engineer. I also make a, uh, a terrible uh, corporate employee. But um, yeah, um, did, did I answer that question, Binay? 
I hope I did. Um, any other questions? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, that, oh, here we go. In your opinion, for a non-data professional, e.g. finance, data literacy or knowledge skill of the data tools, language, and always considered must know to avoid not being left behind in the data world. Okay, that's a great question. So um, there are two, okay, so my point to you, which I think you've picked up, Andy, is that anybody who's not data savvy is gonna be left behind. Um, I think you can't go wrong with having a basic understanding of statistics being reasonably handy with at least some commonly used point and click visualization tool and not using it just to impress people with the pretty pictures but actually understanding how to how to derive insights okay with visualization which is probably the easiest kind of analytics and the most attractive to a lot of people there are actually two skills yeah one is to take an existing insight and communicate it to a third party who probably earns more than you. That's actually really easy from a statistical perspective. It's just a psychological trick. It's all that stuff that they teach in presentation courses. I don't care. There's no real art to it from a mathematical perspective. The real trick, the really hard thing is to find new insights in the first place. And this is what all the advanced visualization is actually useful for. So being able to extract insights um, understanding the basics of statistics, linear algebra, multivariate data analysis. These all, these all sound like really complex things, right? But I think these are going to be everybody's skills. You wouldn't believe how complex today's data literacy would sound to someone in 1980. Okay, but I'm going to, I, I believe that you're going to need all of this to be, um, to be productive. I also think if there's one skill, if there's one skill I think I wish everybody would acquire, and the one skill that comes first, it's what I call critical thinking. It's just being able to think from first principles, to think logically, to think, to think in a structured, logical, skeptical way. It's being able to understand when someone's making a good argument, when someone's making a bad argument. It's being to understand what are the key components, what are the, what are the reasoning paths, and how one might, one might test a set of ideas, and so forth. If you've got that skill set, which very few people have. You usually need to do a philosophy degree or a pure maths degree to really get it. If you've got those skills, then, then the other stuff is actually very easy to acquire. So I would say if there's one must, must have skill that's a foundation to all of data literacy, it's critical thinking. And yeah, I've got a course on that too. Okay, so a question from David. So would you consider a data analyst who is good at digging out Digging out the data management need and visually communicating it well is not data literate if they don't know much formal stats. Okay. The management we have today and the needs of management we have today is nothing to pat yourself about. I believe that just about every, well, just about, let's just say a majority of the customers of analytics, the really powerful customers in analytics, the people who pat you on the back and say, that's a great report don't deserve to be in those jobs and don't understand what they're looking at. And are usually looking looking at these things, not in terms of how it helps them make better decisions, but how, how it might make, it makes them look good, often just by how pretty it is. That's, that's my experience. So to rephrase, to, to look through the question again, so would you consider a data analyst who is good at digging out the data management need? So understanding the needs of people who actually, first of all, need the dug out, that's a, that, that's, that's a red flag right there. Will that be the case in the future? I'm betting not. I'm betting decreasingly. I'm, I'm betting that organizations are going to need less and less management who don't even know what their questions are. Yeah? I'd say the sort of managers, and I know quite a few, the sort of managers who are data literate, the sort of managers who are curious, and the sort of managers who are themselves quite well served by data, they can be helped by someone more advanced. But... Uh, you know, they can actually think critically, they can think logically, and they actually have decisions to make. You're going to see more of those succeed, I think, in a time of adversity. And the whole visually communicating thing, well, the, the bit you skipped, maybe maybe, you, maybe it was in there, the bit you skipped was um, extracting insights in the first place. I think the most key skill, the data literate skill, is extracting insight. It's not, 
you know, getting along with not very data literate people is not a data literacy skill. Um, communication of really, really simple stuff. I wouldn't, well, okay, fine, call it part of data literacy if you want, but it's a very trivial one. And not knowing formal stats, that's okay, but having informal but intuitive stats, that's key. And I don't think this is taught. So to give you an analogy there, um, the Western musical tradition is all about written music. Yeah, You cannot be a concert pianist or a composer and not be able to read sheet music. They go hand in hand, yeah? But in so many other musical traditions, we have blind musicians. The ability to create music, the, the ability to, first of all, envision music, if you will envision, and, and then to make music, to make beautiful music, is completely divorced in a lot of cultures from the ability to write music down. And indeed, for a long time, there was no such thing as writing music down. But it turns out that the same thing applies to stats and mathematics. It turns out that just like with music, there is such a thing as feeling mathematics. There is such a thing as having an intuition for, a sort of a zen for statistical concepts. And it works two ways. I mean, I went to university with people who were fantastic at passing exams, but I don't think they actually got what they were passing exams in. I mean, they could even prove theorems. They could even generalize. It was great, but they didn't really get it. They didn't really see it. And similarly, I can, but in, in a lot of my courses, what I try to do is I try to explain this stuff at an intuitive level with little or no formula. So if, if by formal stats you mean, you know, squiggles on the board, yeah, you don't need those, but you absolutely need the concepts. Anything from you, Mr. Wallace? Well, I think you've just actually ruled out any of my future in data because you said that one of your first recommendations is to do a master of stats. And I hadn't failed an exam in my entire life and, until I did statistics in my last year at school and I got 19%. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. You just shattered all my dreams. <laughs> oh, no. so what, what are you going to do now? I have no idea. I'm still trying to work out what I'm doing anyway. <laughs> so one of the things that you mentioned, Eugene, there, uh, you know, is useful to sort of ha have in your tool bag other than, you know, a good um, academic deliberate understanding of what critical thinking is, um, you know, have a good sort of data visualization uh, tool and obviously stats in there as well. Um, running a data science shop, do you think that there is an increasing need for people to understand how um, automation works so you can actually spin up like data container, uh, sorry, Docker containers with your favorite data visualization tool in it? Or let me give you an analogy. You... Yep. I say this in every one of my classes because people ask me, you know, what, what about what about Docker containers? What about Kubernetes? What about, well, in the old days, they used to ask me about Hadoop. Now, then they asked me about Spark. Now they're asking me about this. And my answer is, look, all those tools are great. They perform miracles. Yeah. I haven't learned how to use any of them. If I need it, I can easily find someone who can do it. And they change all the time. And here's the best part. Mm -hmm. To me, they're just like the sewerage system. What do I mean by that? First of all, until I mentioned the sewerage system, you hadn't even thought about it. The sewerage system saves more lives than modern medicine. So if you had the choice between getting rid of antibiotics and doctors and hospitals or the sewerage system, you'd get rid of the antibiotics, doctors and hospitals. Did you, did you know that? Now, the sewerage system makes life incredibly pleasant and incredibly safe and incredibly healthy, but uh, it does its job. The better it does its job, the more invisible, the more invisible it is. We don't even have to know about it. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is my relationship with, uh, with with the various automation tools, to be honest with you. What I find is that the automation improves all the time and things that used to require enormous deliberation become apps and they become completely invisible. However, the data literacy stuff, actually envisioning envisioning the way information affects decisions, that's nowhere near automation. And by the way, when that gets automated, there will be no jobs left because that's that's like full AI. That's the last job to go. So with all respect and as having said, hey, I think both of our jobs are necessary. And if we're going to fire one of us, it would be me. Because if you know, chances are they need one of you more than they need one of me. But when they need one of me, they really need one of me. And when they need one of me, the stuff you guys do, well, 
I'm just watching it become invisible and I'm watching all of you guys sort of always run one step ahead of automation. I don't have this problem. Does that make sense? Sure. So you you basically rely on having on having a network or having ability to be able to touch um, a data engineer somewhere. Not well, because... maybe. Um, actually, more and more rarely. I need and the only time I actually need to touch a data engineer is okay. I have my training hat. I don't need data engineers. I have my data science hat, and I never need data engineers. Sometimes models need deploying, and yeah, that's where I need a data engineer. But the deployment stuff, I, the thing is, I can always find one. Um, it's when I'm actually wearing my entrepreneur hat and I'm actually needing to scale up some product. So I need things to be, you know, scalable, reliable, fast, all that sort of stuff. That's when, you know, like I, I had a meeting, um, I had a meeting on the weekend, and uh, a fellow who works for me told me about how he's he's worked out a. Uh, a, a Kubernetes architecture for one of the products that we have, and that's a good thing. We need that. Um, look, I know nothing about Kubernetes, but it was very easy to have a chat with him and understand what it is that he's done for us and how. So uh, I'm not dismissing. I'm not dismissing the importance of the of of good engineering. I'm not dismissing the need to be able to manage good engineering. I'm just saying it's a completely different skill. And if I was uh, I was a strategic decision maker faced with tremendous challenges with the possibility of my company being ruined if I make bad decisions. I would suggest that I'd need to might be much better at talking to my data scientist to understand what recommendations my data scientist is giving me because that's what data literacy is also. Data literacy is the ability to understand what the heck data scientists and data analysts are saying to you because you can only dumb it down so much um, and, and still meaningfully add value to it. Whereas I'd leave it to the data scientists to worry about whether there's anything to say to engineers. Um, you know, uh, I'd say the CEO is not going to spend that much time worrying about how to automate things directly. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah, because there seems to be quite a few people putting on talks these days. You know, DevOps, DevOps for data people, and I think for like some people, it we it might be quite a useful skill to have. So if, if anybody's out there uh, that is interested in gaining some skills around the, you know, the Docker stuff or the, or the Kubernetes stuff, uh, we, we also run the meetup groups in that space. And you, of course, you're more than welcome to pop along, including you, usually. Oh, you can you. get it on your LinkedIn profile. And finally, you'll be a marketable person. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I'm so, yeah, I'm very, very concerned about that. I have a few more questions that I'd like to answer because I've just come up, if I may. There's one about, is there any overlap between economics and data scientists? And I'll say, actually, massively. Remember what I said about how the most interesting, complex and important data science you can do is trying to infer causality, trying to infer cause and effect relationships and make decisions on that basis where you can't build proper randomized control trial experiments. Well, one group of people who does that extremely well is econometricians. And what I often say is that econometricians make some of the best data scientists out there. So the data scientists with a computer science background, which includes me, so I can say this, I've got a computer science background and I find, I find that people with computer science backgrounds often lack a lot of important essential data literacy. And I'm talking about people with PhDs. Um, as compared with people with stats backgrounds, but the really elite data scientists, I find, tend to be econometricians and physicists. And here's the big surprising part, philosophers. I really value people who have a background in critical philosophy. And the fellow I was mentioning who showed me that uh, Kubernetes architecture, critical philosopher, actually. Um, so that's that's that question. Uh, um, th th thank you for your comment. Uh, Jagatpati, I'm sorry, uh, the, the printing is very small. I can't quite read your name. And I can I see that uh, Demeter Berberu has asked two questions, and here's hi to Demeter, who's a regular at Data Science Sydney. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Last chance for questions, folks. Going once. Going oh, twice. Going <laughs> Now, I'm not sure what the sort of, you know, the virtual equivalent is to saying, can we have a round of applause? But I think we need to do this. 
there needs to be a new sort of emote, okay, like an emoji. <laughs> I was just clap, you know. How are we going to do it? Can we get some suggestions down in chat as to what the new emoji might be for uh, clapping? I'm trying not to make mine look like the clap because that might um, be a slightly different yeah, thing. Is this going to turn into a video? Is this going to be YouTube or whatever? Can I link to this? If that's okay uh, with you, we would love to. We'd love to uh, put it out as a video for those people uh, tonight. And also, uh, there was a few people that did RSVP to say that they were very sorry, but they couldn't make it. So if that's okay with you, uh, we'd love to make it available. That's that's fine with me. That's fine. Um, yeah, uh, please send me the link as well. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Eugene. Really, really appreciate it.